Hi everyone, and welcome to Calling All Vegans, where we aim to network, support, and activate the vegan and animal rights communities, discuss the V word in a relaxed but unapologetic way, stamp out speciesism, and encourage pre-vegans to open their eyes, minds, and hearts and become vegan. I'm Sue Spar. This is my friend and co-host, Alec Bosse. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for tuning in to another episode. If you're not aware, we uh, now have our own YouTube channel, and it's very important that you uh, make sure to comment, like, subscribe, and share the videos so that we can help get this uh, great content out to everyone. Well, our guest today is both an artist and a jock. He's a retired professional ice hockey player, now working as a freelance videographer and web designer, who also created and starred in the documentary For the Voiceless, which was screened at the 2018 Ottawa International Vegan Film Festival, and it tells the story of his evolution to vegan activist. It's a film that will resonate both with those who are still habitually exploiting animals and they who have made the connection and abandoned animal unfriendly practices. I absolutely loved the documentary when I saw it, and it's not just because I appear in it several <laughs> times. Please welcome Jordan Owens to Calling All Vegans. Hi, Jordan. How are you doing? Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. And thanks for the introduction. That was lovely. <laughs> My <laughs> pleasure. Now, I was reading that many players enjoy chicken and pasta as their pregame meal. Uh, was this so for you? And what did you switch to after going vegan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the chicken and pasta thing, that was probably my favorite part of the documentary. And um, for those who have seen it and those who haven't, that was completely unscripted. Like, I didn't tell the guys much about that question. I just asked them simply, like, what do you eat before a game? And in the hockey world, it's, it's honestly like a running joke. Everybody eats chicken and pasta before a game. If you're lucky, you might hear a guy, you know, say he eats broccoli as well or some other veggie. Um, but yeah, I was no different before I went vegan. I was on the chicken and pasta bandwagon, just like everybody else, throwing some bread there, maybe a little ice cream for dessert if we're on the road. But yeah, mainly chicken and pasta before and after games. It's just kind of a staple of um, not only hockey players, but I think a lot of athletes kind of gravitate towards eating that for a meal. Definitely. I know that uh, when I was much younger, I used to swim competitively. And that was one of my... Uh ways to kind of do the recoup would be a big bowl of pasta with a, with some chicken breasts on top of that. So I mm. definitely get it. Now, what did you switch to after that though, once becoming vegan? Yeah, I was all over the, the map, but, but mainly I think I just swapped out the chicken for mainly chickpeas or black beans or tofu. And it was the exact same meal. It was just kind of swapping one, one ingredient out for the other. And I tell that to all the guys, I'm like, it's it's so easy, guys. Just stop eating the chicken, throw in like beans or, or whatever. Like I usually gravitate, like I love chickpeas. That's my go-to. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it still took all the boxes there. Were you able to uh, convince any of your uh, other players to maybe uh, adapt a little bit more plant-based options instead of the chicken? Yeah, I think I have one guy. Uh, I guess you could say that I, I feel confident saying that I converted him over um yeah he's still playing on the same team and he's very he's a smart guy he's he likes deep conversations he thinks uh critically and like when you have these open conversations with people if they're like an open mind and they're a critical thinker like they're, it's it's pretty obvious what what the right choice is especially if you're into morality and ethics and stuff like it's kind of a no-brainer some other guys are a little bit thick-headed and maybe stuck in the ways. <laughs> And it, like, I'm not ragging on him. I was the same too. I, I kind of, I always said like, I'll go vegan. I totally know it's the right thing, but like after I'm done playing hockey, because I need protein, I need meat to, to keep my muscles. I need meat to, to stay strong. And I, I was in there and I, I can admit now I was completely out of ignorance. I didn't know anything about anything about nutrition, probably more than the average person, but nutrition is a, it's a giant, it's a mountain. There's a lot to learn. And yeah, I, I wasn't even close to the summit of learning. And yeah, my vegan journey kind of uh, kind of helped me along along that way. And yeah, I'm just glad. I'm glad I'm at this point now. I wish I did it earlier. Once you did switch over to a completely plant-based diet, did you find that there was uh, any changes in your athletic performance? Yeah, yeah, I did immediately. I felt 
and actually felt this uh, probably two seasons before I went fully vegan. I saw a documentary, I think it was Food Inc. And believe it or not, like that was the first documentary that really opened my eyes towards animal agriculture, factory farming. Like, it's kind of weird to say, like, how, how did you, how did I not know? But like, honestly, I knew where, where my meat came from. I knew it was an animal, but it just never clicked that yeah. mm-hmm. the whole story that's behind the scenes that we don't see. And it was kind of like a, a mental battle for a few years. And I decided to like up my veggie game. I just probably doubled or, or tripled the amount of veggies that I was eating um, before a game. And I felt that had a huge effect on me, uh, more energy on the ice. But then when I went, went vegan, it was just like that next level. Um, my recovery was amazing. I was recovering super fast. I was able to play at like ultra high intensity, not only for games, but also practices. Even those practices the day after games and everyone's kind of dragging their ass a bit. And I was out there flying around and I loved that. I needed that. I was a type of player that was, was really uh, like energy based. I was a four checker. Like if, if you, I had one kind of trait of my style of play of hockey, you would say like, I'm an energy player. So getting more energy and, and sustained energy was just like a, a golden ticket. Nice. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, with all the traveling that you've done as a pro hockey player, um, which city would you say catered the most to vegan? Uh, Berlin, for sure. I thought, Berlin. yeah. I, as yeah. soon as I saw you were playing in Germany, I was like, he's going to say Berlin. Yeah, my wife would probably say the same. Berlin is is amazing for, for vegan food. And um I didn't play hockey in this city, but I think it's it's right up there with Berlin and actually Toronto. I like Toronto's pretty good too. I really love Toronto for the vegan scene. Um, uh, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv yeah. is is mm-hmm. the next level as well. I've yeah. heard really good things about the uh, the food the vegan food scene there. Mm-hmm. Really good. When we had uh, Mark Pierschel, yeah. here, uh, he did. Um, mm-hmm. The, uh, the documentary, The End of Meat, and he echoes what you said about Berlin. Like they, it just, he was, his mind was blown, right? So, yeah. Um, so along with sadness, regret, and guilt, a lot of people are angry that they were played or duped so long uh, by the powers that be. What was your reaction to waking up to the deception and indoctrination of the whole animal egg industry, et cetera? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you got to pretty close like I I felt duped for sure um it doesn't feel good to get one pulled over on you no one likes that feeling um and it, it like I use the analogy in my documentary like I compared it to um the matrix and taking that red pill you know when I watched when I watched earthlings and like I mentioned earlier like it a few years before like I had hints like people were kind of or documentaries were just kind of giving me peeks behind the curtain and just never really like sunk in until earthlings and that kind of just blew the top off everything for me um yeah and then it, then it was just like kind of shouting from the top of the mountain like hey guys like look look what i found out like everyone around me, you guys got to know what's going on like you got to pay attention you know it's one of those things so and the thing is you think that uh because you know this and that you're telling people this that they're gonna go whoa wow i'm gonna be a vegan too and they don't have the same reaction so what would you say was your inspiration for the documentary wanting to wanted to inspire others mainly i love filmmaking i love storytelling and it was kind of like i can i can put that together and kind of do it do it for a good cause do it to raise awareness and at the time like i was playing professional hockey i had uh, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, teammates, there was fans, and I just had an opportunity to kind of like use my platform, however small it was at the time to, to raise awareness. Um, I just wanted to tell the story and I wanted to, I wanted to change people. Like I wanted people to feel moved. I wanted them to watch it and feel something and, and kind of feel the same feelings that I did when I watched Earthlings. But I also wanted to make it lighter as well not as hard hitting as earthlings i wanted people to watch it because a lot of times when you send people some videos of factory farms or slaughterhouse footage they don't want to watch it and then you're just not getting through to them and right away their barriers just come up so i wanted to make it um kind of powerful but not, not i didn't want to knock their socks off i wanted them to laugh and enjoy it but also like get the message 
Well, that actually, that was a question of mine that uh, humor definitely is a spoonful of sugar that can help any inconvenient truth such as veganism go down. And I take it that was part of your strategy with the film, as you said. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like to use comedy all the time. Like I'm the type of person that laughs at everything. I think everything is funny, even yeah, stuff I shouldn't be laughing at. There's always a funny side to it when you kind of scope out and look at it from the big picture you know imagine yourself on the international space station looking back at earth like all the stuff we fuss about is just such nonsense um so that's kind of my take on on it so i definitely use uh, humor a lot in my approach so as as vegans we are able to sway so many people to adopt at least a plant-based diet if not a vegan ideology uh, but the lament of vegans everywhere is how difficult it is to convince those close to us, particularly family. How did you manage to do the near impossible, uh, especially with your adorable grandparents who are around mm -hmm. 80 now, I guess they would be. Yeah, it's, it's really just came down to the approach um, and, and how to how to relay a message to people who have their defense system fully engaged and they have every excuse under the sun. You have to be prepared and, and not from a place of contempt. You have to be open and compassionate and, you know, just kind of, you know, when, when you're versed in, in the theory, I guess, behind veganism, you know, all the answers to the justifications, it's very hard to argue. And, my approach is more about asking questions than just stating facts. And when you ask someone a question and they can't come up with the answer, it kind of like, yeah, I guess they kind of get the picture that way. I've had multiple conversations with my family members, you know, through those first few months going vegan. Um, my grandparents, especially my grandma was probably the toughest nut to crack, but she's, uh, <laughs> she's pretty uh, religious and, you know, was using, you know, God put, animals here for us to eat kind of approach you and never heard that one before <laughs> yeah and it turns out like she's the most fiery passionate vegan i know like wow. i gotta cool her down sometimes for <laughs> sure because she's going at people on facebook and her down, old uh, woman. <laughs> yeah oh yeah she gets going she's very passionate now well she sure loved that uh, meal at hogtown vegan i'd say Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah we wanted to like i always try to bring people to the junk foodie type of vegan places just because those are the type of meals that transfer over kind of seamlessly for people mm -hmm. um like a person who's used to eating like ribs and burgers and fried chicken and stuff i'm not gonna bring them to like a health vegan no. spot because yeah it's just a totally different ball game i love i love that too but i also love the junky stuff I love to, you know, give people the, um, like a, a full jackfruit sandwich, you know, that's an easy one. The Beyond Burgers and stuff, like, you got to be real with people. You can't tell the difference anymore. It's 2020. These, these like, alternative meats, they're just too bang on now, so. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's, you're, you're trying to invite them to change, but you can't invite them to change too much or they're going to push back. They're going to really mm -hmm. balk, right? So if For you're sure. presenting something to them that's, yeah, hey, this is what you eat anyway, and look at this, you know, yeah. but yeah, start trying to damn too much health down there, and they'll come to that eventually, then, mm -hmm. on their own, so, you hope. <laughs> on the topic of favorite meals and food choices, there's a question that I like to ask all of our guests, and that is, when you wind up on the desert island with a companion animal pig, and if we were able to get you one meal that you could have for the rest of your life. Your companion animal uh, friend is able to have whatever meal they want as well. But what meal would you choose as your one meal on the deserted island? And I do believe you had this uh, question in the film as well. It is a, I wonder if my answer will be the same now. Um, I just <laughs> ate, so I'm full. So I'm not actually thinking about food. So it's probably gonna be a more beneficial answer for my body and sustainability and everything. Um, ask me when I'm hungry, it's going to be a totally different answer. When I'm hungry, it's going to be a pulled jackfruit sandwich. That's my go-to. Um, I just love it. I'll never turn it down when I'm at a restaurant. If that's on the menu, that's what I'm getting for sure. But I do love bowls. So it's, it, it depends Ooh, on the day, I guess. I love you're bowls. Like level 1,000 yeah. vegan there. Huh? Yeah, I love brown rice and avocado and kimchi, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 
Oh, I, what I do want to ask you just off the side, uh, were you, uh, would you have considered yourself an enforcer while you were playing? I, goon is such an ugly word. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, if you type my name in YouTube, yeah, you're probably going to think that. Um, <laughs> but having said that, I, I don't consider myself um, an enforcer type player at all. Um, I just came up like I'm an 86 birthday. Like I came up through my professional career before Instagram was really like popping before YouTube was just like all over the place. So like games, when a fan is recording a game, they're just recording the fight, you know? So that's how I got put on YouTube as a hockey player. My whole career just seems to be fights, but I didn't even really get in that many fights. You know, like it's just yeah, um, yeah. they missed they missed all the goal. I didn't score that many goals either. So but they, <laughs> well, <laughs> they got all the fights, none of the goals. So it's kind of sad. No, you must yeah. have done all right because I mean you were contra contracted to the Red Wings and who oh, who was the oh the Rangers? Yeah, the Rangers first, and then I was traded to the Red Wings system, and I played in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's all yeah. right. Excellent. So for individuals that are interested in seeing your documentary uh, for The Voiceless or any of your other future projects, what are the different ways to reach out and find information about you and your work? Or even to hire this man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of film work uh, lately, but you can find me uh, on Instagram and also YouTube uh, under the same name, Joe Adelic. And also I have a new family channel that I started with my wife and daughter um we're, yeah we're kind of doing uh vlogging we're doing what i eat in a day videos we're talking about veganism we're talking about just uh, all that kind of good stuff so we're just having a lot of fun over there so yeah you guys can check that out it's called a tribe called owens and okay. that's the name of our youtube channel we're also on youtube under the same name a tribe called owens and oh, yeah a lot of fun very good yeah yeah that's we just good. love to create and we love to have fun and travel and we've we've We've, we've learned a lot through all our travels and over the years, and we just are at a point now we want to share with people, and especially people who are new to veganism or have kids and don't know what to feed their kids. We're yeah. kind of hitting all, ticking all those boxes over there. So, Well, yeah. I was afraid to ask you if you were raising your daughter vegan because I didn't know what answer I would get. So I thought, just hold that. Better not. So that sounds <laughs> yeah, like yeah. No, she, our daughter, yeah, she's one and a half. She's, she's fully vegan. Um, we don't, it's... You know, we buy the groceries right now. Yeah. That's what's in our house. It's it's totally as she gets older, it's her choice. Something, you know, it's it's her choice. If it, it's but we're gonna teach her our our values. We're gonna teach her love and compassion, and she's gonna make the right choice. I'm I'm totally confident of that. You know, so yeah, it is what it is. She has complete autonomy with her her decisions within reason. Obviously, her age as she progresses, but yeah, she's we're definitely not forcing her to do anything. So it'll well, all be up to her as she, she ages. She certainly looks like she's thriving, so no worries yeah. there. She's, she's, yeah, she's already a very loving, compassionate little one, so I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it'll grow. Oh, glad, so glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. I, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. So, and I had to actually reach out to Sean Stratton, who is the uh, founder of uh, the Vegan Film Festival. To, to find to get your information, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys, for having me on. Oh, yeah. not at all. So, um, again, thanks again, everyone, for your support. Um, we do ask that you kindly uh, subscribe to our new YouTube channel, which is Calling All Vegans. And please like, comment on, and share our videos. So. Thanks again, everyone. And thank you for uh, tuning in today. Y'all have a great day. Cool. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. This is a movie about my journey from animal lover to the other kind of animal lover. And the main difference being a shit ton of hypocrisy. Today we're at Hawktown Vegan in Toronto. Um, taking my grandparents here. They're new vegans, transitioning vegans. So, what did you think of the vegan meal? Yeah. Oh, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you right. What'd you think of the vegan meal? I loved it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Over the last year and a half, my life has changed. I buy different foods and I eat at different places. I exchanged anguish with fortitude and stubborn selfishness for love. But the biggest change is within. I'm no longer at war with my conscience. I no longer need creative excuses to justify my contribution to the inhumane industry of animal agriculture. <laughs>